You're feeling good about your understanding of cellular respiration. You have in hand the answers to how you get the energy needed to power your endergonic cellular reactions so that you can dance your dance, think your thoughts, and dream your dreams. As you sit down to a delicious dinner of stir-fried beef and bok choy over rice, with a side of kimchi, you muse about the destiny of the food molecules contained in your dinner. You trace their journey in your imagination, metabolized via glycolysis or another metabolic pathway to form acetyl-CoA, fed into the citric acid cycle to produce NADH and FADH2, powering the electron transport chain's proton pumps, and spinning ATP synthase to make all the ATP your little cells could possibly want. But as you sit there, Adrift in the pleasant imagining of metabolic pathways, chewing a piece of beef, your reverie is interrupted by a terrifying question. Where did the energy in the beef come from? But, ah, a soothing voice says to you, that's obvious. It came from the plants the cow ate. The plants make those food molecules. The cows eat them, and then you eat the cows. You chew on, satisfied until a thought begins to gnaw, unceasing, at your mind. Your fork falls from your hand and clatters to the floor. How do the plants make those food molecules? How? As horror overwhelms you, your appetite, once so fierce, disappears entirely. You're no longer hungry. Except, that is, for knowledge. Hello! If you're here, you're probably curious about how plants make food molecules. It's a good thing to be curious about, and I hope we'll be able to answer the question by the end of this video. Now, if we want to know how plants make food molecules, we ought to go to the place where they make them, and that's the leaves. Here we have some beautiful leaves from, in fact, a bok choy plant. Let's zoom in a little further with a light microscope. As we zoom in, we can make out within the cells of these leaves uh, small green bodies. And these small green bodies are an organelle that you're, by now, fairly familiar with. These are chloroplasts. So let's take a look inside the chloroplasts and see if we can't figure out where these food molecules are coming from. Here we have a diagram of a chloroplast which shows the general structure. Now you can see that there is an outer membrane of the chloroplast shown here in dark green, an inner membrane of the chloroplast shown here in a lighter transparent green, and then within the inner membrane, there's another set of structures. So this is actually a third set of membrane-bound structures at the heart of the chloroplast. We call these membrane-bound stacks thylakoids, and they are right there at the heart of the chloroplast. Now the fluid, which is in between the thylakoids and the inner membrane, we call the stroma. Also, just like in the mitochondria, between the inner and outer membrane, there is a space which we call the intermembrane space. Everything which we're discussing in this video, however, is going to be taking place right here inside the stroma. So let's zoom in there and see what's going on. Okay, don't be overwhelmed. We're going to take this one step at a time. So here we are inside of the stroma, and we notice that we're surrounded by enzymes and molecules, and a series of reactions is taking place around us, and a key output of all of those reactions is glucose, the very same glucose that we can use when we eat plants to power our cellular activities. How is this glucose made? It's put together from two components, well, through a series of reactions, but through uh, a component called G3P, which is produced continuously in the stroma of the chloroplast. So how is G3P? P created? Well, it's the output of a process called the Calvin-Benson cycle, or as you'll often hear it called, just the Calvin cycle. The Calvin cycle's product is G3P, which is used to make glucose, and actually is, is the first step in a lot of other synthetic building up reactions inside of plants. So how does the Calvin-Benson cycle work to make G3P and therefore glucose? Let's answer that question right now. Let's start with this stage right up here, where we see water and carbon dioxide entering a cycle of reactions. Let's take a look on the right side of the screen in a little more detail. So here we have a starting molecule called ribulose bisphosphate, to which carbon dioxide and water are added to produce this intermediary molecule right here. This process of capturing carbon dioxide from the air is called carbon fixation. We say that the carbon from the air has been fixed which just means it's gone from a gaseous state in the atmosphere to a 
state where it's bound up with the molecules of the plant, making it easier to manipulate and build stuff out of. Carbon fixation is one of the things that we ought to be very grateful uh, to plants for. All right, so we fixed the carbon. We've got this intermediary molecule right here. Let's see where we go from here. Now we can see that intermediary molecule is going to be modified. It's going to be reacting with ATP and a molecule called NADPH in order to form this molecule right here, which is G3P. Now remember, G3P, that's the molecule which is going to combine to form glucose. So there we have it. We've already formed the G3P right here. Now, in order to form the G3P, we actually need energy and hydrogen, which are supplied by ATP and NADPH. NADPH may sound rather familiar. It sounds rather like NADH, which we saw in cellular respiration, and in a lot of respects, it is really similar. So what we have here is energy being used to modify this molecule to form G3P, which then later can be used to build glucose. So this series of reactions uses the energy of ATP and NADPH to produce G3P, which can be used to make sugars. That's the Calvin-Benson cycle in a nutshell. But you'll notice there's more of the cycle to go, so we may as well uh, follow this thing through to its conclusion. So some of the G3P that was produced is actually reacted again with some ATP to regenerate this molecule, ribulose bisphosphate, which is the reactant required in order to fix the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So just like in the citric acid cycle, this is a cyclical series of reactions where we end up with the original reactant right there back in the beginning. To summarize here for us, the Calvin-Benson cycle is a series of enzyme-catalyzed reactions that capture carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and use the energy of ATP and NADPH to produce G3P, which combines to form glucose. That glucose is the very same glucose which you might acquire from a plant after eating it, use uh, in the process of glycolysis to make pyruvate, then acetyl-CoA, feed into your citric acid cycle, uh, make NADH and FADH2, power your proton pumps, spin your ATP synthase, and there you have it, dancing your dances, dreaming your dreams, thinking your thoughts. We've found it, the source of energy for all of your reactions. But wait, we haven't totally answered the question yet because once more, we found another source of energy that needs explaining. In order to make the glucose, we need G3P. In order to make the G3P, we need NADPH and ATP. So we're left asking the question, where in the chloroplast did that ATP and that NADPH come from? So next time, we've got to answer the question, where does the NADPH and the ATP come from? And where did they get their energy from. Probably the next one will be the last video, right? Right? We'll find out. See you next time. Bye for now.